the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Did you ever play with the Mr. Potato Head toy? Part of the appeal of Mr. Potato Head is the seemingly endless combination of eyes and ears and hats and shoes that you can put on Mr. Potato Head and make him into whatever you want him to be. You can make him look however you want him to look. And you can change the look whenever you get ready. That's, that's the appeal. Sadly, many of us have reduced Jesus to a Mr. Potato Head toy. We've given him our eyes, our ears, our skin, our voices. And he ends up looking and sounding just like us. But is that the real Jesus? Is that the Jesus of the Bible? Is that the real Jesus? Jesus, we're going to spend the next few months making our way through Mark's gospel, seeking the real Jesus, not the Jesus of our imaginations, not the Jesus of our culture, but the real Jesus. The gospel of Mark can be divided into two halves. The first half tells us who Jesus is, chapters 1 through 8. And the second half tells us why Jesus came, chapters 9 through 16. And we actually see both of these as one half of Mark's gospel begins to give way to the other half of Mark's gospel. For instance, look in Mark chapter 8. As, as one half is giving way to the other, look in chapter 8. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? And his disciples said, well, the word on the street is that you're one of the great prophets of old, come back to life. That's who people think you are. And then Jesus asked, verse 29, but who do you say that I am? Because there comes a point when it doesn't really matter what other people think. It doesn't really matter what other people say. There comes a point when what really matters is what do you say? What do you think? Who do you say that Jesus is? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. That is who Jesus is. Matthew adds in his gospel account, Matthew chapter 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's who Jesus is. Go back and reread verse 1 of Mark chapter 1. Mark says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God. That is who Jesus is. Christ is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew Messiah. Both Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. They mean anointed one. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 2, the psalmist mentions the Lord and His anointed. Speaking of Messiah. Or as verse 6 says, my king. Or as verse 7 says, my son. Psalm 2 is what's known as a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that is pointing to Messiah. Sure, there was an immediate context, but then there's this ultimate context that looks beyond the temporal, looks ahead in time. And Psalm 2 looks beyond King David to the one who would assume the throne of David forever. And so this is a messianic psalm. And this psalm declares that this king, this Messiah king, would indeed reign forever upon the throne of David. And so when Jesus is called the Christ, that's a statement of his sovereignty as king. That is who Jesus is, our king. The world didn't recognize him as such in the beginning. No, no. It's like what Jaron was saying earlier. When Jesus was born, he was born into a world that barely took notice of his birth. And the world barely knew of his life. And even his baptism was contained to a select number of people. The world at large never noticed that their king had been born, that their king was alive. They saw a baby, a few saw a baby. Some saw a little boy, some saw a young man, some saw a human life, but Jesus was more than that. He is our King. And when Jesus is called the Son of God, it indicates that He has a unique intimacy and a unique relationship with God the Father. Unique. Oftentimes when we use the word unique, we use it incorrectly because what we mean is unusual. But unique means there is only one. There is no other. Unique. Only one. And Jesus has a unique, God. Jesus, the Son of God, has a unique relationship with God the Father. It doesn't mean that He's a son to the Father in the human sense of a father and a son. It means that His essence is that of the Father. What the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote to the Colossians chapter 1 verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness, as in all the fullness of God's deity, for all the fullness to dwell in Him, meaning Jesus. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. The angel said in Luke chapter 1 verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. God Himself, miraculously, beyond His own law of nature that He Himself had instituted, enabled Mary to conceive a child within her womb. In the same way that the universe was created in the beginning. With only the spoken word of God. God looked into the darkness and the void. And he said, let there be light. And with nothing but his words, light came out of the darkness. With nothing but his words. And he created everything out of nothing. With only his words. And with but his words, he took up residence in the womb of a teenage girl named Mary. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is who Jesus is. And that's good news. That's what the gospel, that's what the word gospel literally means. It means good news. But this good news is good not just because of who Jesus is but also because of why Jesus came. If you go back to that uh, chapter 8 passage in Mark's Gospel, if you look at verse 31, Jesus, it says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man 
must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Jesus came to suffer and to die for sins. Your sins. My sins. Our sins. What he described and what Mark described, uh, uh, given, Mark records the words of Jesus, what Jesus described in Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verse 45, as giving his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to suffer and die for sins. That is who Jesus is. He's the one who bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 That's why Jesus came. That's why. That, that's who Jesus is. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Isaiah 53, 5. That's not just who Jesus is. That's why Jesus came. That's who Jesus is. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. That's who Jesus is, but that's why Jesus came. And listen, if that does not humble you, if that does not cause you to be like John the Baptist when he said, I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I'm not fit, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. If that, if that truth of who Jesus is and why Jesus came does not humble you, then you have forgotten who Jesus is. You have forgotten why Jesus came. Who is this Jesus? Well, I tell you, he's not the Jesus of, uh, of, the, of Mormonism. He's not the Mormon Jesus, a created being and the brother of Lucifer. That's not who Jesus is. The real Jesus is not the Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll tell you that Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel, the first created being. The real Jesus is not the Isa of Islam, merely a prophet who never actually died upon the cross because Allah would never allow his holy prophet to die upon the cross. By the way, if Jesus never died on the cross, then he never rose from the dead. The real Jesus is not the Jesus of legalism, cruel taskmaster and prison warden using shame and guilt to keep us in line. The real Jesus is not the hippie savior of Jesus Christ superstar. The real Jesus is not a Republican or a Democrat. The real Jesus is not an American. The real Jesus never spoke a single word of English. The real Jesus is not some Mr. Potato Head toy that we can tailor to our tastes. The real Jesus is not a means to an end. He's not a connecting flight. He is the final destination. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that Jesus is more than a marriage therapist. I'm saying Jesus is more than a financial advisor. I'm saying that Jesus is more than heaven itself. Jesus is not a means to an end. He is the end. The beginning and the end, in fact. So if you're using Jesus to get to somewhere else, if you're using Jesus to get to something else, if you're using Jesus to get to someone else, then you're missing who Jesus really is and why Jesus really came. You're missing the Jesus, the real Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. The real Jesus provoked humility from John, honor from heaven and hatred from hell. Look at these with me very briefly. The real Jesus provoked humility from John. John the Baptist is actually a major player in redemption story. John the Baptist announced Messiah's coming. Jesus was the prophesied Messiah, but John was the prophesied messenger. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. 
There hadn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years. And so when John came on the scene preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, everyone with even a remote understanding of the Jewish faith believed that the age of Messiah had come. The kingdom of God was near. The age of Messiah had come. And John was calling people to prepare their hearts for his coming. He was calling them unto repentance. He was calling them unto soul cleansing. He was calling them to prepare for Messiah. Some even thought that John was Messiah. But he was quick to dispel that notion. He said, after me one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. But first, Jesus would come to John in order to be baptized. All four Gospels tell us this. You need to believe and, 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 and put stock in everything the Bible says. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. But when you read something that all four Gospels repeat, you ought to take note of that. I mean, it's one thing for a couple or even the three synoptic gospels to say the same thing. But when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all, all tell you something, it's, 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 it's worth noting. And all four gospels tell us that Jesus came to John to be baptized. But John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Jesus didn't have anything to repent of. People were confessing their sins. But Jesus had no sins to confess. And still he came to John to be baptized. Not because he needed to be baptized per se. But in order to identify with righteousness, he was baptized. But Matthew's the one who tells us that John hesitated. John resisted this opportunity to baptize Jesus. He was so overwhelmed at the presence of Jesus that, that he said to Jesus, Matthew tells us this in Matthew chapter 3, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me to be baptized? In other words, I can't do this. I'm unworthy. I'm the last guy that should be baptizing you. John, in the presence of, of absolute holiness, John became utterly aware of his sinfulness, his unholiness. I should, I should be baptized by you. How is it that you come to me to be baptized? John knew that he was unworthy compared to Jesus. He was Jesus' cousin. He was God's prophet. But he was unworthy nevertheless. And he was overwhelmed in the presence of Jesus. The real Jesus provoked humility from John. John just wanted to hit his knees. John wanted to to hide his face from Jesus' eyes. He, he, he was humbled in the presence of Jesus. Some of us have become so familiar with Jesus. We've been at this thing of faith for so long that our familiarity has bred contempt. If we'd have been in the Jordan River with John that day and heard John saying, I, I can't baptize you. I, I'm not the guy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. Some of us, if we'd have been in the Jordan River with John that day, we'd have said, hey, Jesus, come on over to me. I'll baptize you. Because we had become so familiar with the things of God that we've lost our sense of awe. The presence of God, the power of God, the majesty and might of God no longer overwhelm us. If anything, we yawn at the glory of God. We yawn. But John, oh, he was gripped by the glory of God in human flesh. He was moved by the majesty of God as a man. He was of God incarnate. The real Jesus provoked humility from John. And second, the real Jesus provoked honor from heaven. 
Immediately, verse 10 says, immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. I don't know how many people John baptized. I have no idea. My guess is a bunch. You say, well, how much is a bunch? Well, it's it's a whole lot. Well, how much is a whole lot? More than you can count on your fingers and toes. I don't know how many people John baptized. I just know that he baptized a lot, but I'm going to tell you something happened that day that they had never seen happen before. The heavens opened up, and a, and, and a dove began to fall out of heaven, fly down out of heaven and land on Jesus. This dove, the Holy Spirit of God, like a dove, the, the Father spoke from heaven and, and, and said, this is my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased Something different happened that day because the triunity of the Godhead, the Trinity, is evident at Jesus' baptism. God the Father speaks, God the Son is baptized, and God the Spirit descends like a dove. And the significance of each is that collectively they represent the coronation of the King. Once again, the world had not taken notice that their king had been born. The world didn't know that Jesus was their king. The demons knew it. The stars of heaven knew it. The wind and the waves knew it. But people didn't know this. But at his baptism, he received his coronation as the king. Now, let me me be quick to say that Jesus didn't become a king on that day. He didn't become Messiah that day. He didn't become the Son of God. He didn't become Christ that day. He didn't become divine that day. That's what false teachers will tell you. No, he was always those things. But on this day, he was recognized in earth and from heaven. He received honor from heaven. You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. That's who Jesus is, our Messiah King. But John gave us a glimpse into why Jesus came as well. John's gospel, John the Apostle, please don't let me confuse you here, but John the Baptist and John the Apostle are not the same guy. John the Apostle was a disciple, John, and best friend of Jesus. John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, different guy. John the Apostle's gospel account, chapter 1, verse 29, records the words of John the Baptist. Have I confused you yet? Records the words of John the Baptist when John the Baptist announced at the baptism site of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. And so it's not just who Jesus is, it's why Jesus came. The real Jesus provoked humility from John, honor from heaven, and third, hatred from hell. Look further in the text with me, verse 12. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. In her book, Demon... Tosca Lee, the author, imagines Lucifer believing that never had God been more vulnerable than when he chose to share in the humanity he created out of mud. All of of Satan's past attempts to thwart God's redemptive plan had failed He had attempted to prevent Jesus' birth. He had had attempted to kill Jesus after he was born. He had tried to keep Jesus from ever becoming a man. And yet all of those attempts had failed over and over and over again. But but now things were going to be different. Tosca Lee, she, she imagines Lucifer being convinced that all, because all the other mud people, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what the demon in, in her book calls humans because we're made out of the dust of the earth we're made out of mud that that that, that because all the other mud people every single one had fallen to satan's temptation and now 
Lucifer had an advantage he had never had before because now God had taken the same form. God had become one of the mud people. And so now he was vulnerable. This was his chance. Listen, Satan hates God and he hates everything holy. The Bible never says it with those words exactly, but we see the opposition. We see the hostility of Satan against God from the Garden of Eden forward. He is the accuser. In fact, that's what the name, the word Satan means. It means accuser or adversary. We use that word as if it is the devil's given name, but it's not really his name. It's his job description. It's what he does. He accuses because he is the accuser. Like a prosecuting attorney, he lays out the evidence against us and he makes the case against us. Jesus said that the devil is a murderer. He said that he's a liar. He said that he's a thief. He even said that he's the ruler of this world, this fallen world. And so if Satan could cause this God-man to fall, then the devil will have finally succeeded. In all of these attempts across thousands of years, finally, Satan will have overcome God himself. Whatever it was he was attempting to do that got him kicked out of heaven along with a third of the angels, whatever it was that he was attempting to do then would all have come to fruition, would all have paid off in the end because if he could get this God-man to fall, then Satan will have won. And so all the hatred from hell was unleashed against Jesus in the wilderness. For 40 days, Jesus faced the temptation of Satan. I want to tell you something about this temptation that is unlike any temptation that you've ever experienced. You say, well, you know, I I can understand. No, you can't. Because you know what you and I do in the face of temptation eventually? Oftentimes we give in and we give over. We don't know what it is to face the full brunt of Satan's temptation. Because eventually we say, enough, and we just, we give over, we give in. But Jesus didn't. Forty days he was tempted by the devil. And and once again, Matthew adds to the story what Mark does not tell us. Matthew tells us that he fasted for those 40 days. And so physically, he would have been weakened. Once again, from Lucifer's perspective, giving an advantage that that he did not have before. But in the end, Jesus resisted the devil, used the scriptures to do so, and Satan's plan was foiled once again. The real Jesus provoked Humility from John, honor from heaven, and hatred from hell. Which leads me to ask you, what does the real Jesus provoke from you? I think it'll either be adoration, or anger, or apathy. The real Jesus will so overwhelm you that you will say, I love him. Or the real Jesus will so anger you that you will say, I hate him. Or else you'll say about the real Jesus, I just don't care. I don't care. What does the real Jesus provoke from you? What does the real Jesus draw out of you? Think with me as we begin to taxi toward the terminal. In 1993, the unthinkable happened. Superman died. In 1993, Doomsday killed Superman. This was not the first time that a comic book killed off its main character and found a creative way to bring him back. But this is Superman. Who who thought that Superman 
could die. But in 1993, Superman died. The death of Superman turned out to be one of, if not the best-selling graphic novels of all time. And as the, as, as, at the time, as, as that comic book was released, people lined up for blocks and blocks and blocks. They waited for hours and hours and hours. They were willing to endure all sorts of, of discomfort just to get their hands on a copy of the death of Superman. Yet what Superman did in a comic book, Jesus did in real life. He died to save the world. Not a work of fiction, not a comic. This was real stuff. Jesus died to save the world. Now, listen, I don't expect the unbelieving world to take much note of that. But I do expect that professing Christians would be so moved by who Jesus is and by why Jesus came that they would bow before Him. They would love Him with all their hearts and they would serve Him as their King. But some folk who say they're believers give to the things of this world what they never give to God. Their allegiance, their resources, their time. Give to the world what they never give to God. More interested in the things of this world than the things of God. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I've never seen a single episode of Game of Thrones. Don't plan to. So this is not some kind of tacit endorsement. You don't have to send me an email. I've read the reviews. I understand what kind of show it is. But I've never seen a, an issue of the Game of Thrones. I'm just simply using this as an illustration. There were eight seasons, 73 episodes, and if what I've read is correct, the episodes were anywhere between 50 and 82 minutes long. 73 episodes, 50 to 83, 82 minutes long. Audio Bibles are usually around 75 hours long. Which gives us an idea of how long it would take to read the Bible from cover to cover. Somewhere in the same time frame as it would take to watch every episode of Game of Thrones. So, if you've watched every episode of Game of Thrones, but you've never, never read the love letter our Lord gave to us, you've never read the Bible from cover to cover, then you're giving to this world what you're unwilling to give to God. And so it begs the question of what holds our hearts it begs the question of who is our Lord? What is it that we really believe? I love the Lord. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Does that play out in the rest of our lives? Is that revealed in the priorities and practices of our lives? Tell me, what does the real Jesus provoke from you? If you're here today and, and you've, never, you've never turned from self and sin to trust in Jesus, I mean, get saved. I mean, be born again. If you've never received Christ as your Savior and your Lord, I beg you today, turn from self and sin. Trust in this Jesus who died upon the cross, rose from the dead, that you could be saved. Your sins could be forgiven. He'd give you a new heart. Would you today come to Christ? There may be some here today, and if you really get honest about it, you have to confess, you know what, this Jesus that I've been talking about all these years, this Jesus that I, I believed in, turns out 
I was putting my eyes, my ears, my skin, my voice on Mr. Potato Head all along. And the Jesus that I've been trusting in isn't the real Jesus at all. I've been trusting in me. I've been trusting in this mirror image of myself to be saved. And my righteousness is as filthy rags. If that's you, then let the real Jesus provoke humility in you like it provoked in John. And come to Jesus. Pastor, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think I can do that. All these people think I'm already saved. I mean, I, I've been baptized and, 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 and I'm a member of this church. All these people think I'm already saved. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't come out now and admit that I'm, I'm really lost. I'm not saying that's an easy thing to admit, but let me tell you, or let me ask you, would it be worth going to hell over? Trust in the real Jesus. Maybe there are some Christians here today who would admit, I, I'm, I'm born again, I know that I'm saved, but, but familiarity has bred contempt in my heart. And I'm just as liable to yawn at the glory of God as I am to, to be in awe at it. Jesus is what I do on Sunday. And I take Jesus off just like I do my Sunday clothes and I hang him in the closet until next weekend and then I take him back out and I do Jesus again. But I don't let Jesus mix with the rest of my life. We talk about the same Jesus. We talk about the real Jesus. Because the real Jesus, he's 24-7, 365 and add on to that eternal. And so maybe some of us need to just be honest and say, I've, I've been playing games with God, and I'm sorry. We're going to have an invitation. And during this invitation, I'm going to be standing here. Pastors will join me down front. The altar will be open if you just want to come pray. But as we sing a song, this is an invitation song. An invitation is just what it sounds like. You're invited to respond to, the, to the, the word that has been declared today. But my prayer is that the voice that you're responding to is the voice of God, not the voice of some preacher. You sense that God is speaking to your heart, and you're ready to say yes, you come. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, we'll stand, we'll sing, and you come. Gracious Father, thank you for this privilege. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place helping us to better understand who Jesus is and why Jesus came. And Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to massage and apply this word to each of our hearts. Help us, Lord, to receive it. Help us, Lord, to believe it. Father, I pray for those who need to be saved to be saved. I pray for those, Lord, who've been worshiping a Jesus that is but a mirror image of themselves come to faith in the real Jesus Lord I pray for those of us who are born again Lord that you would just empty our cups and fill us afresh and anew with a sense of your glory a sense of awe that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.